Take a seat. I think we're about ready to start our next session. It's our great pleasure today to hear from Professor Brett Scharfs, who is a Francis R. Kirkham Professor of Law at Brigham Young University's Law School and Associate Dean for Faculty and Curriculum, as well as serving as Associate Director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies. Um, he wears many hats and wears them very well. He has a distinguished um, training and background. He was a graduate of Georgetown University, was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, and a senior editor of, of the Yale Law Journal when he attended the Yale Law School. Um, I've worked with him as a colleague for many years and I'm grateful for his um, quick wit, his articulateness, and um, his graciousness and kindness as a colleague. I'm excited to hear from him today and I will, without further ado, give him the floor. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. I uh, uh, appreciate that introduction. Uh, we've really been given a big treat this morning with uh, Governor Herbert's uh, visit. Um, sometimes you hear something that is so memorable that you think it's going to become one of those uh, principles you live by. And his observation that he strives to be conservative in principle, moderate in tone, and inclusive in process, I think is as about as lovely and succinct and profound a political mantra as I've ever heard. And uh, I'm really grateful I was here this morning to hear that. And I'm going to try to live my life a little differently uh, based upon what I learned from uh, Governor Herbert this morning. Um, I also appreciated his telling a joke uh, on lawyers that actually included politicians. I've heard that joke before, uh, but I've never heard politicians included in the, uh, in, in the punchline before. But it reminded me of another story. It involved a, a rabbi, an imam, and a law professor uh, who were traveling together in a car that broke down. And they were in the middle of nowhere and had to begin walking, and they, as dusk was settling, saw a farmhouse aglow in the distance. And they walked up and asked if they could have a uh, safe harbor uh, for the night. And the farmer graciously agreed. But he told them that, unfortunately, uh, there was only room in the house for uh, two of them. And one would have to uh, sleep in the barn. And the rabbi, being a good and magnanimous soul, uh, volunteered and went out to the barn. And about an hour later, there was a knock on the door. And he said, my heart was pure and my intent was good. but..." There are pigs uh, in the barn, and as someone who keeps kosher, uh, I'm not able to uh, uh, sleep uh, in, in, in the barn. And so uh, the imam uh, went and said, uh, I will uh, go uh, stay in the barn. Uh, but an hour later came a knock on the door, and it was uh, the imam. And he said, well, you know, as a practicing Muslim, I too really can't sleep in a barn uh, with pigs. I'm sorry, my heart was pure and my intent was good. And the law professor, not so much with a pure heart and good intent, said, well, I guess that leaves me. And he went out to the barn. And an hour later, there was a knock at the door, and it was the pigs. <laughs> saying, well, normally we suffer in silence, uh, but there are some indignities that are even too great for a pig to endure. <laughs> All right, well, I'm shifting gears in this presentation slightly from the main focus, which has been uh, largely domestic, and I'm going to talk about international human rights. And uh, one important question is why this might be important for us working largely in a domestic context. And I think the answer is that sometimes, uh, as Americans, there's a possibility that we can be viewed as being arrogant, as being parochial, and as uh, thinking that uh, the American way is the one and only or best way. And the truth is, uh, international human rights terminology, thinking, 
and vocabulary has become so important in the fields of uh, freedom of religion that we're going to be much more effective in our ability to engage and discuss and be participants in this area if we are knowledgeable about and conversant in uh, basic human rights norms and uh, terminology. And so in this presentation today, I have two goals. The first is to convert you in about 30 minutes to the top one-tenth of one percent of global citizens' understanding of international human rights. Now, that isn't as difficult a task as it sounds like because global understanding of human rights is so low and so abysmal that even uh, in 30 minutes, I think I will be able to take you into the top tenth of one percent of uh, global citizens. But this is going to be a little bit repetitive for those of you who were here last year of the introduction to human rights that I uh, did last year. So I apologize uh, for that. But I think this is a topic that is complex enough and subtle enough that I need to be reminded of it from time to time just so it stays fresh. So my apology is not wholehearted, it is half-hearted. Um, the second thing I want to do is I want to talk about how human rights are implemented around the world. And this grew out of a teaching experience I had in June in Indonesia. I was teaching at a program uh, on Sharia and human rights, trying to, uh, trying to uh, encourage Islamic thinkers to think of ways to build bridges between uh, Islamic law on the one hand and human rights law on the other hand. And I began listing with them how do human rights norms get implemented around the world. And they came up with a list of about 15 different ways. And I'm going to share that list with you because I think it has resonance and echoes with a lot of what we've been talking about here over the last three days. So that's my plan, is to address these two questions. What are human rights and how are they implemented? Professor Marianne Glendon of Harvard Law School in her magnificent book on the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights called A World Made New says this, the moral terrain of international relations was forever altered one night in Paris on December 10, 1948, when the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights without a single dissenting vote. It was actually December 11th, because by the time everyone was done with their congratulatory speeches, the strike of midnight had already taken place. But think about it. A unanimous declaration uh, arising out of the ashes of World War II. When the UN Charter was drafted in 1945, the great powers, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, showed little interest in the Human Rights Project. Why? Well, the Soviet Union is easy to understand. Uh, their concern was for communal interests, uh, economic and social rights, perhaps, but certainly not political uh, freedoms. Great Britain, trying to hold on to the remnants of empire, and uh, the voices in favor of human rights were largely voices in favor of the right to self-determination of peoples. And uh, so uh, Great Britain was not interested in the Human Rights Project. What about the United States? Racial segregation. Uh, we had a big issue of race relations in the United States, and there was a concern, partly regional, but nat national as well, that uh, human rights would uh, be very disruptive for the balance of social relations in the United States. The UN Charter itself briefly mentions, but does not give content to the idea of human rights. But the Allied powers had described the war as a fight for freedom and democracy, and those who longed most for such freedoms were slow to forget the world they had been promised. And so it was small countries, NGOs, in large measure, that uh, were the impetus, the moving forces uh, between the human rights movement. In addition, as appalling photographs from Nazi concentration camps surface, 
the U.S. agreed to the creation of a special commission on human rights, and President Harry Truman had the responsibility of appointing a U.S. delegation. He turned to Eleanor Roosevelt, the still grieving widow of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, this was a remarkable thing that Eleanor Roosevelt did. Uh, she became the chair of the Human Rights Commission and, in a way, the anchor that saw through its completion. And yet I, as an American school child, didn't learn anything about her role in uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights when I went to school. Uh, one of the things I do is go to uh, education law conferences, urging uh, American educators to rethink the way they teach human rights in American schools, and certainly the role of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, some opposed her appointment because of her inexperience in international relations. Believe it or not, she had hardly traveled abroad. And others opposed her because of her liberal and outspoken nature. Uh, she had been a columnist during most of the time of her uh, husband's presidency in the leading women's magazine of the day and was often criticizing her husband's administration uh, in, her, uh, in her column. It is said that Franklin Delano Roosevelt prayed at the end of each day, Dear Lord, please, make Eleanor tired. <laughs> it's also said that not once was his prayer answered. Um, in any event, uh, having agreed to do this, she threw herself into the task with an energy and uh, with a uh, passion that was uh, really remarkable. In all, there were 18 nations on the Commission on Human Rights. Look at this list. Uh, this is at a time when the United Nations was comprised of about 50 uh, countries, none of which were African. Uh, and so what we have is a really remarkable effort to balance North and South, East and West, developed and less developed. Uh, those uh, uh, allied with the Soviet Union uh, and the Communist bloc versus those that were allied with uh, the Western uh, powers. Um, as well as religious diversity. Uh, we have uh, uh, Hindu majority countries, Muslim majority countries, Christian uh, majority countries, and uh, uh, countries with state policies of atheism. So uh, religiously the diversity was quite uh, significant. Indeed, I think if you were trying to balance a, uh, uh, a set of countries, I'm not sure you could have improved upon uh, what, uh, was, uh, what was done. What I want to do is focus on a few of the provisions of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, just to give you a flavor for the tone, the character, the language of uh, the Universal Declaration. This is the introductory proclamation. This is just a part of it. But it says the UDHR declares itself to be a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations to the end that every individual and every organ of society keeping this declaration constantly in mind shall strive by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms and by progressive measures national and international to secure their universal and effective recognition and observance. I read that slowly. I'm not going to go back and comment upon it, but virtually every phrase that I stopped and read slowly deserves elaboration. Uh, and I will uh, leave that for your uh, self-elaboration. Uh, but do note the idea of it being a standard of achievement common to all peoples and nations. The idea of teaching and education uh, the idea that it involves national and international and that it is going to be progressive uh, through progressive measures. This is the preamble. Again, it's much longer. I'm going to just highlight three elements of it. This first element of the preamble is a broad declaration of principle. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. The idea of human dignity is there at the very beginning and becomes the most important concept in the international human rights projects. The ideas of equality, of inalienable rights, all of these are echoes 
and are drawn from previous rights instruments. The notion of family, that we are all part of one family uh, of human beings. Next, looking backwards. Uh, here, as we read this, we cannot help but hear echoes of the horrors of the concentration camps, uh, the horrors of Japanese uh, imperialism and enslavement of peoples in uh, Asia. Whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind. Sometimes people say human rights are lofty ideals. They were enacted by people who are dreamers. And I think this does a grave insult to the men and women, the statesmen and stateswomen, who had endured the crucible not just of World War II, but of World War I, had looked evil in the face, had sacrificed in a way that it's difficult for me, perhaps most of us, to understand, to overcome that evil, and wanted to make a declaration that history should not repeat itself. And so there's this backward-looking element to the first half of the 20th century and what had happened in the world in that period of time. The next element of the preamble is forward-looking. Whereas it is essential, if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights be protected by the rule of law. So this is a forward-looking warning as well, saying that individual human beings have rights, including the right to revolt in the face of oppression. And so there's a, a, a sobering seriousness uh, uh, here that we see in the preamble as well. Well, look at Article 1. I'm only going to talk about two or three of the articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But think about this. This is really remarkable and careful and inspiring. Article 1 declares, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. This article creates what I describe as a framework for human rights discourse. In this one clause, if there's nothing else you know about international human rights, if you are conversant with Article 1, you're going to be in a position to engage anywhere in the world uh, in a lingua franca that is common to all of us, these important ideas. Think of it, all. How important is that, that we begin with the idea of inclusion rather than exclusion? The very, very first idea we see in Article 1 is that this applies to everyone. To whom? Human beings. To all of us as uh, 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 human beings. Why? Because we're born. These rights are not something that are bestowed. These are not something given by King or Congress. These are features of our human character. That's the declaration that is made in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. How are we born? Free and equal. Not free in every way, not equal in every way. Some of us are tall, some of us are smart, some of us are of different colors of skin. But how are we equal? In dignity and rights. That's a remarkable declaration. And it goes on to say, we human beings are endowed. Notice that by their creator is no longer there. This is an echo of the Declaration of Independence. But the reason their creator is not there is because there's an effort to make this inclusive so that believers as well as non-believers will feel and understand that this applies equally to them. Nevertheless, they are endowed with what? With reason, one of the things that makes us human, but also conscience, not just the ability to think rationally, but also the ability to feel, to receive. In the, in the Latter-day Saint tradition, I think we'd call this the light of Christ. Uh, all endowed with conscience. And should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. 
Uh, and so this is the basic framework for human rights discourse that we see in, uh, in, in Article 1. The idea of conscience was proposed by the Chinese delegate, a man named P.C. Chang, a philosopher, a playwright, uh, a, a broad pluralist uh, humanist. And he noted that rather than saying that all human beings are born endowed with reason, we should say conscience as well. And the word he had in mind was not the English word conscience, but the Chinese idea of ren, which is made up of the Chinese character of man. That's the little thing that looks kind of like an eye, a slash with a line. That's the character for man. And then the part that looks like an equal sign is two. Uh, so literally it means two-man-mindedness. But it can be translated as empathy, consciousness of one's fellow man, humanity, or benevolence. I think this is interesting because both reason and conscience, as translated in English, are inward capacities. They're things that we do kind of in our head or, or in our heart. But Ren is the other great thing that makes us human. And that is the capacity to love. The capacity to be genuinely other regarding. And I think it's unfortunate that that concept of Ren was not captured in the translation of the word that was translated as conscience. I'm glad conscience is there, but I'm, I wish that that idea of Ren, it's a little bit like the African concept of Ubuntu, uh, was uh, on its face. Perhaps it's captured better in the following phrase, the, the, the spirit of brotherhood. Uh, because that spirit of brotherhood implies an outward, other regarding uh, character of our human capacity that isn't quite captured by reason and, uh, and conscience. What might be different if Wren was really kept in mind? Well, if we really kept in mind the other, including religious minorities, sexual minorities, when forming and implementing policies, uh, I think that uh, we've learned something important here at this conference, uh, 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 Senator Adams emphasizing that there was a big Republican majority. And uh, if there was a simple majoritarian impulse, we would never have gotten anything uh, like uh, uh, the, the Utah Compromise. And so Wren really asks us to think of the other uh, while we're uh, uh, legislating. From a religious point of view, I think this is important because there is no majority religion in the world. It's easier to maintain two-man mindedness when we continue to remember that we are all part of a minority. And this becomes difficult when we consider ourselves to be part of a majority. I think for LDS people, this is something that we ought to understand really well because we have the experience of being the majority someplace and a tiny minority almost everywhere else. And what we have to remember is that when we are in a temporal or temporary majority, we want to always be thinking with this attitude of two-mindedness, with uh, sensitivity uh, to minority uh, uh, views as well. And when speaking of human rights, Wren helps us remember that rights ought to also and always be considered uh, in conjunction with duties. Now, as a technical legal matter, rights imply duties. But the rights holders are individuals, and the duty holders are states, governments, who owe their subjects, their citizens, the people within their jurisdiction, uh, the rights. But what Wren does is it helps us understand that that's not the only kind of duty that is implied by rights. There's also the duties that fall upon us as rights holders to exercise those rights responsibly and to uh, reciprocate in our uh, treatment of others as well. Let me run quickly through a few of the other key provisions of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 2 uh, is uh, the grounds of inclusion. Uh, everyone is entitled to the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Article 7, 
equality, non-discrimination, equal protection. Article 18. This is the article that is most relevant to uh, freedom of religion. Again, I want to read through this. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Again, you can read the history of the drafting, the development of Article 18. Every word, as you can imagine, has been carefully uh, chosen. Again, we begin with everyone, all human beings. Religious freedom, freedom of thought, conscience, and belief is not limited to citizens or permanent residents. Non-resident aliens, stateless persons also have the right to freedom of religion or belief. So do foreign religious leaders, religious personnel, and missionaries. Human beings do not lose their rights by taking on religious roles. These rights belong to everyone. Next, has. Religious freedom is not something bestowed by the state or its statutory regimes. Individuals and religious groups have these rights simply by virtue of their human nature. They may not be recognized, they may not be in effect, but those rights are there and claims to those rights can legitimately be made. It's a right. It's not a privilege or a gift. What's distinctive of a right? It's not just an interest. What a right is, is something that has a legal claim. Uh, something that you can look to the state and say, you have an obligation to uphold and protect me in the possession of this thing. And it's important that uh, the freedoms of thought, conscience, and belief are rights. It's a freedom. This is important too because it's not reducible to equality or equal treatment. We can have equal treatment in the gulag, right? Everyone can be treated equally there. Uh, and everyone can have equal freedom of conscience in the gulag. But what's required by Article 18 is not just equal treatment, but freedom. Freedom of thought, conscience, and belief. Thought, conscience, and religion. One of the big debates we get into is how do you define religion? Well, it's very interesting. And sometimes we have to answer that question. Think about the IRS rules for who gets a tax exemption. The IRS has about an 18-prong test. It's a little bit like a victim stinian family resemblance test. And it works pretty well for determining who should and should not qualify for tax-exempt status. But as a matter of international human rights law, it doesn't matter because the protection is broad. It includes thought conscience and religion. And so whether something is defined as religious or non-religious doesn't ultimately matter with respect to the perspective of international human rights law. As the UN Human Rights Committee has said in general comment number 22, Article 18 protects theistic, non-theistic, and atheistic beliefs, as well as the right not to profess any religion or belief. The terms belief and religion are to be broadly construed. And as a religious person, it's important for me to repeat this frequently. Because one of the things that is important for the nuns, for those who are more than just nuns, who are convinced, sometimes strident, atheists, is that religious freedom matters to them too. Because the protection of thought, conscience, belief, and religion is what protects them to have, to hold, to profess uh, their beliefs uh, as well. One unfortunate reality is the human rights community tends to be divided between secular and religious human rights advocates. And one of the things I think we want to be mindful of doing is breaking down the uh, barriers uh, between uh, those different uh, uh, interest groups. The right to change. Uh, most Religious human rights experts have seen the right to convert from one religion to another or to no religion as fundamental to the freedom of religion and belief. Of course, not all traditions have recognized conversion as a fundamental right. The drafting of Article 18's recognition of the freedom and right to change one's religion caused division among nations with large Muslim populations. 
And so, for example, Saudi Arabia abstained on the final vote, adopting the UDHR. It's interesting to know that the Saudi delegate was Christian, but he was representing the uh, Saudi Muslim uh, point of view. Uh, other Muslim countries did not object to the inclusion of the right to change religion or belief. For example, Muhammad Khan, the foreign minister of Pakistan, uh, who was a Muslim, although from a Muslim minority group, promised the full support of his country. Citing a passage from the Quran, let him who chooses to believe, believe, and him who chooses to disbelieve, disbelieve. And noting that Islam itself is a proselytizing religion, Khan expressed his view that the freedom to change one's religion was consistent with Islam and that faith could not be obligatory. But it's important to know that, that this word change in Article 18 was one of the most sensitive, controversial uh, elements of the entire uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In community with others, freedom of religion or belief protects activities that have social or communal dimension. It's not just a private right. It includes manifestations. Freedom of religion or belief includes the freedom to manifest one's religion in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. That sequence was designed to be broad and inclusive, not to be limiting. Uh, and they describe in an expansive way the general types of conduct embraced within the general category of religious uh, activity. Well, every right has limitations, and the limitations for all of the rights in the UDHR are contained in Article 29. When we get to some later treaties, uh, international and regional human rights conventions, sometimes the limitations are included in specific provisions. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But here for the UDHR, the limitations are broad and apply to all of the rights in the same way that are articulated. What are those limitations? Well, we can have limitations, but they must be determined by law. So the first thing is, this is a rule of law constraint. They can't be arbitrary. They can't just be administrative. They can't be just discretion of the police or some other bureaucrat. And they must be solely for the purpose of securing due recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others. So there is the possibility that my rights may need to be limited so that your rights can be uh, recognized. And they may be limited for beating the just requirements, not just the pretensive requirements, but the just requirements of morality, public order, and the general welfare in a democratic society. And as you can probably imagine, most of the debate about the scope of human rights takes place in a debate about the legitimacy of limitations and the scope of limitations based upon these limiting bases, morality. If this is going to be broadly understood, we can imagine all kinds of limitations on human rights. Public order. If public order is uh, uh, envisioned broadly enough, you can imagine all kinds of limitations. And uh, general welfare. Uh, well, I can imagine limiting a lot of your rights uh, to protect the general welfare. So this is really where the crux of the debate focuses in international human rights. Well, one thing to understand about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is it doesn't have the status of international law. It was a UN General Assembly resolution and after it was complete there was a hope that in relatively short order, there would be a binding treaty uh, that would uh, be a convention that would have the status of uh, hard international law. But it turns out that the ideological differences between East and West prevented progress. And by 1951, the Commission decided to adopt a two-convention approach, one focusing on economic, social, and cultural rights, and the other on uh, political uh, rights and freedoms. And so after that it took another 15 years to get the ICCPR and the ICESCR adopted. These are sometimes known collectively as the International Bill of Rights. So that's a term that is used in human rights discourse. 
This includes the Universal Declaration of 1948, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. I'm not going to talk a lot about these, but I did want to just uh, provide this framework uh, for you. As of 2014, there were 158 states that were party to the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Convention, 162 states party to the uh, Civil and Political Rights Convention, and 114 states party to the first protocol. The first protocol basically provides a mechanism for citizens to make complaints directly to the United Nations for alleged violations of uh, their human rights. The U.S. has ratified the Political and Civil Rights Convention, but not the other, and China has ratified the Economic and Social Cultural Rights, uh, but not the other. Iran and Iraq, for example, have ratified both. There are a few countries, Cuba, Malaysia, Myanmar, Saudi Arabia, that have ratified neither. I want to talk about just one provision, a couple provisions in the ICCPR, mainly to contrast them with what we saw in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Here we have Article 18. Uh, Everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right shall include freedom to have or adopt a religion or belief of his choice and freedom either individually or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in worship, observance, practice, and teaching. Looks a lot like the UDHR. There's a word that's missing, the word change. Uh, again, very controversial, this idea of the right to change, especially for Muslims, to some extent for Hindus. Uh, frankly, for some Orthodox Christians uh, are not very keen on the right to uh, uh, convert as well. Um, but notice that it's finessed. We have the right to have or adopt a belief of his choice, so there's an individual right and a right to manifest. And then it says in article, paragraph 2 of Article 18, no one shall be subject to coercion which would impair his freedom to have or to adopt a religion or belief of his choice. So again, the right to change in all but a word. Freedoms manifest are subject to limitations and there's also a provision having to do with rights of uh, legal guardians over the education of their children. Article 19 is the free speech uh, provision and uh, one thing that's interesting is that the permissible limitations are actually a little bit broader than the permissible limitations on freedom of religion. I'm not going to uh, talk about that uh, in detail today. Uh, also a provision against religious hatred. We hear a lot about hate speech uh, and blasphemy uh, and this is what the ICCPR permits. It permits limitations on incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. And so that would be the type of uh, activity that would justify limitations on uh, freedom of speech, including hate speech. Um, Article 21 is the right of peaceful assembly. Article 27 specifically protects minorities, ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. And Article one of the optional protocol provides a mechanism for individuals to uh, assert grievances against their states uh, to the United Nations. Well, if you're interested in looking at this in greater detail, I'll make the presentation available so you can go back and look at these, but the United Nations finally has a really good website and all of these are readily accessible in a uh, very clear, succinct, organized way that's based on date. Uh, you can go through by decade and click on all of the important human rights uh, documents that uh, uh, occur. There are a number of other international human rights treaties that touch upon freedom of religion and belief, including the Treaty Against Genocide, the Convention on Education, Racial Discrimination, Discrimination Against Women, and the Rights of the Child, all of these raise important, subtle debates, uh, but I'm not going to address them uh, here today. And then there are some other international human rights instruments. There was a hope to create a binding treaty on freedom of religion and belief, but 
In the end, that did not turn out to be politically feasible, and so the U United Nations in 1981 adopted a declaration, which is, again, a General Assembly resolution, something that doesn't have binding international law status, on the elimination of all forms of intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief. Now, one thing to recognize is that most of this repeats language from other treaties. So the fact that it's not itself a treaty ought not be exaggerated in its significance. But it is useful because there is an article, Article 6, which explains in greater detail some of the things that had widely come to be understood as included within the right of thought, conscience, and religion. And these include things like the right to worship and assemble, to establish and maintain places for these purposes, to establish and maintain charitable or humanitarian institutions. Turns out it's really important for religious groups to be able to have charitable uh, arms and activities. To be able to make necessary articles and materials, uh, think of religious clothing or items used in religious ceremonies, to write, issue, and disseminate publications, to teach the religion or belief in places suitable for those purposes. To solicit and receive voluntary financial and other contributions. To train, appoint, and elect leaders. To observe days of rest, holidays, and ceremonies. To establish and maintain communications with co-religionists from other countries. So, uh, especially for those of you operating in the international arena, having the 1981 Declaration and Article 6 in your pocket can be a helpful way of framing discussions because most of the countries in which you're dealing are going to have governments that, are, that voted yes uh, on the 1981 uh, declaration or are parties to the international conventions uh, that this is an elaboration of. And it can be a way of just framing a discussion in ways that uh, can be facilitative. There are additional, a number of UN monitoring institutions. I have these included on the slide if you want to go back and look at them. I'm not really going to talk about them uh, in our uh, presentation here uh, today. In addition, we have regional human rights treaties. The most important of these is the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. I'm going to talk a little bit about the European Convention and the European Court because with uh, respect to human rights discourse, this has become, I think, the preeminent uh, international forum. Uh, article 9, look at that. It's a lot like Article 18 in the UDHR, a lot like Article 18 in the ICCPR. Freedom to thought, conscience, religion, freedom to change, freedom to manifest in public and private. Limitations, only those that are prescribed by law, necessary in a democratic society in the interest of these enumerated ends. And so, the forum internum, belief, may not be subject to limitation. The forum externum, manifestations, are subject to carefully defined limitations. The way the European court analyzes claims is always the same. They ask whether a limitation is prescribed by law. Then they ask, is it based on one of the legitimating grounds? The answer to both of these questions is almost always yes. And then the final question is, is the limitation necessary in a democratic society? And that becomes a matter of balancing. It's a little like the compelling state interest test in the US is a matter of balancing. Well, the European Court is a remarkable institution. It covers 47 countries, 800 million people, 18 time zones. It took from 1950 to 2008 to reach 10,000 judgments. Since then, we've reached 20. So the work uh, has uh, really escalated. Now, interestingly, um, of those first 10,000 cases, 20, 25 had to do with freedom of religion. So we freedom of religion folks like to talk about those cases ad nauseum. Uh, we have an entire case book you can get out on the table uh, that discusses most of these cases in detail. But look at this. 3,500 length of proceedings, 2,700 right to fair trial, 1,800 property, 1,200, 1,300 liberty and security, 500 private and family life. 
It is fair to say, though, that these cases on thought, conscience, and religion have been significant. And many are viewed and recognized by Europeans, by European court experts, as the most important and influential of the uh, decisions. Well, I want to shift gears now and talk about mechanisms for implementing human rights. When I got to law school, I thought I wanted to be maybe an international lawyer. And I imagined that what that meant was learning international law, which I imagined to be sort of a strata of law that existed above the Constitution and below God's law. So it was sort of a, a, a dome over uh, uh, national law. It turns out it's not quite like that. Uh, and international law takes a lot of forms and is implemented in a lot of different ways. And I've been thinking about this over the course of our discussion here. I'm going to mention 15, and I'm going to have to go quickly. And then I'm going to open the floor for discussion. First is national constitutions. It turns out that perhaps the primary place where international human rights norms are implemented are in national constitutions. All but about a half dozen constitutions of the world have been enacted since the end of World War II. And almost all of those constitutions implement, in one way or another, sometimes with interesting variations, the international human rights uh, norms that we see in international treaties. And so uh, one of the primary places where uh, human rights norms are implemented are through national constitutions and through the in judicial interpretation and state implementation of those constitutional provisions. And oftentimes it's possible to use international human rights precedents to help countries understand the meaning of their own uh, national uh, provisions, especially when they track very closely the exact language uh, of uh, the international human rights instruments. Next, statutes. Think of the statutes that we've discussed here over the last few days. Uh, Senator Hatch was one of the key sponsors of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Senator Lee is now a sponsor of a new law that is designed to uh, try to uh, react to some of the threats uh, to religious freedom arising from the same-sex marriage uh, decisions. More than 20 states have adopted state referents. Uh, the Utah Compromise and the role of uh, Senator Adams and Governor Herbert that we've uh, discussed here. And it's important to realize that as Governor Herbert emphasized this morning, this, the uh, Utah Compromise didn't arise as if unbidden from the dust. It was basically a extension of an earlier compromise that had been worked out four or five years ago involving the anti-discrimination uh, ordinance in uh, Salt Lake City uh, that the LDS Church was also quite involved in, uh, in, in supporting. And so when we think about our role and where we can get involved, you think of the percolation. It may be that much of our capacity or uh, opportunity for involvement may be at the local level. And that can become very uh, important and very significant. Next, regulations. Think of the power, uh, again, emphasized by, uh, uh, I think, Professor Wilson yesterday, of governors uh, with executive orders and their control over regulatory agencies. This is an area where a lot of us might have uh, influence uh, in the uh, regulatory agencies that we interact with. Think of the uh, worry that many religious people have today of the Bob Jones problem, right? This was the colloquy uh, between uh, Attorney General uh, Varelli and Justice Alito about our religious universities that don't step into line with respect to gay marriage going to be subject to what happened to Bob Jones University, which was they lost their tax exempt status. And he said, well, I don't know, it could happen. That's something we're going to have to worry about, figure out uh, down the line. Well, think about it. Bob Jones University lost their tax exempt status not because Congress enacted a new statute, but the IRS changed their regulation and they decided that a group that discriminated on the basis of religion could not have a tax exempt status. Bob Jones University then sued, that suit went to the Supreme Court, and I think it was 5-4, the Supreme Court 
do you remember, Elizabeth? Uh, decided that uh, there was a fundamental public policy forbidding discrimination on the basis of race. And so that tax exempt status was lost. So uh, what happens in regulatory agencies uh, can, be, uh, rather, uh, uh, can be rather significant. Now, can we imagine an IRS that is motivated by political considerations? <laughs> Another way international human rights are implemented, non-governmental organizations. Here I think of international organizations such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Human Rights Without Frontiers, which focuses specifically on thought, conscience, and belief, and national organizations. The ACLU, historically at least, has been a strong defender of religious freedom. Uh, Jeremy Gunn, who came here from Provo for years, was at the ACLU trying to steer them in a direction that was uh, friendly to religious freedom rather than hostile to religious freedom. We've talked about the Beckett Fund, fund uh, that was imp important in uh, not just the Hosanna Tabor case, but also the Hobby Lobby case. And a lot of litigation support networks exist out there, often uh, affiliated with religious groups. And so if you find yourself as a lawyer with an opportunity to represent a church, with an opportunity to help a religious individual uh, who is uh, facing discrimination, uh, or uh, don't imagine that there are no resources available to help uh, 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 overcome those, uh, uh, those challenges. The media. Think of how powerful the media is in bringing attention to uh, human rights issues. I'd like to thank the press that have covered this conference. Uh, I've seen uh, coverage on ABC, Fox, the Tribune, the Deseret News. That's important. Uh, it's important as we discuss these issues that they become part of a public uh, discourse as well. Perhaps even more important these days is untraditional media. And this may be a place where many of us can make a difference. Social media, Twitter, Facebook, blogs. Now, at times, I think Facebook can seem a lot like the great and spacious building. It's big, it's elaborate, it's floating in the air, and it's full of taunts, derision, mocking, and ridicule. But if we are too afraid to engage and to stand up to the ridicule and the uh, invective, the incivility that takes place on these forums, as our rights and liberties disappear, you know, we'll be able to, as we point fingers, really be you know, pointing most of them back at ourselves uh, because that's the world we live in. And uh, if we're not willing to engage in public forums with arguments and reasons and evidence that are true and credible and correct, then I think we're going to be in, uh, in a world of trouble. Uh, here I think of Alexander Dushku's uh, point yesterday, that we're at a crossroads with the same-sex marriage decision. There are two ways it could go. It could become Brown versus Board of Education, or it could become Roe versus Wade. And I don't think it's predetermined uh, which of those uh, directions it's going, uh, going to go, but it's going to depend in large measure on the public's reaction uh, to uh, the decision. Foreign policy. Uh, one of the remarkable ways that international human rights norms get enacted is through uh, foreign policy, through the State Department. Uh, it turns out that every State Department uh, embassy around the world now has a foreign service officer that has the job of talking to religious leaders about the problems uh, that they're experiencing. And uh, I have seen some of these uh, young State Department officials a few of whom I've known as uh, LDS uh, folks, make significant differences in the lives of religious minorities. Uh, we also have the, uh, uh, the Commission uh, on International Religious Freedom. Uh, Katrina Lantos-Sweat, who was a speaker at our fireside here at BYU last year, is on that commission. Mike Young uh, uh, used to be. Um, think also of the opportunities to interact with uh, 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 foreign leaders. Uh, the Vietnam Communist Secretary had a visit with uh, President Obama yesterday. Less known, he also had a meeting with uh, U.S. religious leaders. Uh, and uh, we were involved a little bit in facilitating and organizing that visit. 
We also organized our center in uh, a conference at Wilton Park, which is a UK conference center on cooperative efforts involving foreign services regarding uh, law and religion. So if foreign policy is a place where uh, you have influence, uh, that is uh, remarkable. What about education? Uh, think of the quality of uh, the professors we've had here. Robin Fretwell Wilson from Illinois, Mark Goldfeder uh, from Emory, uh, and the capacity of education to affect uh, our thinking about uh, uh, human rights. Not just law school, what about Sunday school? Um, can we talk about the roots of human dignity, the idea that we're all created in the image of God? Here I was thinking of Bill Atkin and uh, his uh, description of himself in primary. Do you imagine that Bill Atkin is sensitizing his primary students to the importance of religious freedom? Uh, my guess is yes. Bill, are you here? <laughs> I don't see Bill uh, in the audience, so I can't ask him to deny. Um, <clears throat> What about local zoning boards, uh, land use and zoning? This is, in the United States at least, and I think around the world, one of the places where the most discrimination against religious minorities takes place. I think there's almost an inverse relationship between the stature of the forum and the significance of what happens. Uh, I think what happens that matters most to most religious groups probably takes place in places like the EEOC uh, you think of the experience of the Hosanna uh, uh, Tabor uh, church and school and it takes place at the local zoning board and all of us as lawyers are going to have the opportunity to represent clients who face discrimination uh, uh, in these places. When the Religious Land Use Act was enacted, uh, Professor Durham did a study and uh, surveyed uh, land use uh, st uh, activity and found that there were really large scale differences in treatment between religious majority groups, think Mormons in Utah, and religious minority groups. Think of Mormons in Boston where we had a hard time getting a steeple uh, put on our temple. Uh, and those land use uh, uh, and zoning boards are I think one of the places where uh, human rights uh, are implemented. National human rights commissions. Many countries, uh, for example, I was CC'd on a correspondence yesterday involving Neville Rocho, uh, have human rights commissions. And those commissions are very powerful uh, with respect to uh, international human rights. And uh, they're pretty accessible. Oftentimes we as citizens have access uh, to those uh, commissions and to those commissioners. Bar associations. Think of the law societies in Canada and the problems that Trinity Western is having. Now think of the bar society to which you're a member if you're a lawyer. Do they know you? Are you an active participant? Do you have credibility there? Have you served on uh, committees and in ways that uh, when issues come up that might be uh, important, uh, you will be a, uh, a voice that is respected and listened to? I think those professional associations, uh, it's going to be true for psychologists, it's going to be true for accountants, it's going to be true certainly for lawyers. Uh, we need to be active and uh, participating uh, members of those associations so that when issues come up, uh, we are uh, known, present, and credible. Think of the lawyers and their everyday practice. I was moved, frankly, to tears uh, yesterday with Dino Ware's uh, uh, testimony of uh, the call he felt to represent his church when they were being bullied uh, by the federal government. And he was prepared. He described the types of preparation. But boy, he could have easily given that a pass. Uh, he didn't feel ready. He wasn't an expert on the ministerial exemption. Uh, but he went to work and he figured it out. I think of Gene Scher and the sacrifices uh, you've made, Gene, and I think of Matt Richards and Alexander Dushko. I'm just mentioning a few of the people who we've heard from here today who, as lawyers in uh, their personal lives, in their professional lives, have been able to be significant in the implementation of international human rights norms. Of course, uh, 
churches and their legal departments are obviously very important here too. I think of Lance Whitman and Bill Atkin and I think of the church area council lawyers and the training you give to our law students uh, which is uh, a really significant um, uh, service not just uh, for their education but in uh, helping prepare the next generation of lawyers who will be able to deal with these issues. Churches, I think when you look at U.S. jurisprudence a lot of the cases involve Jehovah's Witnesses who are willing to stand up for their rights. Uh, we have other religious groups such as the Seventh-day Adventists who have large international religious liberty associations. I think of the LDS Church and their involvement in cases of principle such as uh, the Amos case. What about church leaders? Uh, it was mentioned that we've had six LDS general conference addresses in the last few years uh, and numerous speeches uh, by uh, church leaders, uh, impressive speeches uh, to non-LDS uh, audiences uh, uh, around the country. In the Do you know where, uh video yesterday we saw excerpts from one of Elder Oak's speeches uh, back in New York City. Uh, we've also seen excerpts from uh, Elder Christofferson's uh, speeches uh, uh, as well as others. Church public affairs. Um, I was moved by uh, Michael Purdy's description of uh, the role of uh, uh, church public affairs in the Utah Compromise. You might say, well, it's really inappropriate for a majority religion to get involved in legislation in a state where there's such a large majority. But here's the truth of the matter. There would not be protection today in Utah uh, for lesbian and gays in employment and in housing had it not been for the LDS church. That is the truth of the matter. And that was a majority church stepping in to protect the rights of minorities with whom they disagree. And so let's be careful about saying that we want to exclude religious groups uh, uh, from the public square. You can tell I'm on the verge of outrage when this topic comes up because it is such a popular notion that churches ought to stay in their synagogue and talk there but just stay out when it comes to uh, the, public, uh, the public arena. We wouldn't have the Revolutionary War had it not been for religious groups. We wouldn't have had the Civil War had it not been for religious groups. We wouldn't have civil rights. We wouldn't have voting rights. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, the opposition to abortion uh, uh, and, and the rights of the unborn had it not been uh, for religious groups. Uh, so let's be careful before we say that uh, religion ought to be expelled or excluded uh, from the public square. Businesses. Uh, are involved in implementing human rights norms. Again, I think this is one of the most important places where this takes place. Religious uh, business, businesses that try to accommodate the religious needs of employees. Most of the time this is done in undramatic ways. It's finding the employees who have a Saturday Sabbath and those that have a Sunday Sabbath and trying to balance their schedules. Uh, or trying to be sensitive to the holidays and the religious needs of our, uh, of our neighbors. And uh, businesses are in a place to uh, be sensitive to issues of equal treatment and uh, non-discrimination. Friends and neighbors. Uh, I think of our conversations that we have uh, uh, with those close to us, with our family, with our friends. And I think this is a place where we ought not muzzle ourselves. We ought be willing to have conversations. Uh, I think it's easy to say, well, politics and religion off the table. Let's take all these things and just uh, uh, not uh, talk about them. But I think that's dangerous. And finally, the powers of heaven. As I think about the premortal council in heaven, I'm going to talk about LDS doctrine here for just a minute. And Heavenly Father's plan, it was one of moral agency, choice, inevitable sin, atonement, obedience, and repentance. And it was contrasted with Satan's plan, which was attractive, perhaps uh, attracting as much as a third of the host of heaven. It was based on coercion. It was based on the idea that you will do my bidding. I will get you home. It's not just that it was a bad plan. It was that it was a lie. Uh, it's not it, possible uh, to force people into salvation.
And so as I think about this issue of religious freedom, I think the most important thing we can know is that we're on the side of truth and right. Because the idea of religious freedom is, as Bruce R. McConkie said, in a way the most fundamental, not the most important, but the most basic doctrine of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's what made mortality, the implementation of the plan of salvation possible. And as Dino said yesterday, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they be that with them. And that scripture came to his mind from 2 Kings when he felt alone. And I can't remember the exact phrase he used, but he said, you may be standing alone, but know that you never are alone. Uh, did I get that quote right? Does anyone have a sharper and more accurate recollection? It's one of those things I want to remember, and I was trying to re recapture it. I might have to go back to the video and make sure I've got it right. But here I think it's important for us to remember Abraham Lincoln's caveat. He basically said, I'm more interested in being on God's side than hoping that God is on mine. And uh, so I think in all of our work, we want to be uh, careful about that. So think about it. International law, international human rights norms, how are they implemented? Are they implemented through treaty? Are they implemented through the European Court of Human Rights and its uh, enforcement of uh, the European Convention? Well, yes, in 25 cases of the last 20,000 that have appeared before them. But where are the other places where the norms of human dignity, a freedom of religion, a freedom of thought, conscience, and belief are going to be implemented? International law, yes, but in constitutions, in statutes, not just national, but in federal, local municipal ordinances, in the regulations that are adopted through NGOs, through the media, foreign policy, education, zoning boards, national human rights commissions, bar associations, lawyers, churches, church leaders, church public affairs, businesses, friends and neighbors, and through the powers of heaven. What I hope we feel as we look at this list is one thing, and that is there's something I can do. We don't all have to do everything, but each of us needs to do something. And I think the challenge that we have as we come here to a, a conference like this is to not be overwhelmed with the breadth of issues, uh, but to leave with some idea of some specific thing or things that we, over time and soon, uh, can do uh, to, uh, to speak up and to speak out on behalf of uh, freedom of thought, uh, conscience, and belief. As I was preparing this this morning, I was reminded of, a, of Eleanor Roosevelt's nightly prayer. Uh, and as I was reviewing that this morning, I was recollecting my own nightly prayer last night. And let me just say, it wasn't quite as articulate and as beautiful and as moving as Eleanor Roosevelt's. Again, the chair of the Human Rights Commission that resulted in the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Our Father, who has set a restlessness in our hearts and made us all seekers after that which we can never fully find, forbid us to be satisfied with what we make of life. Draw us from base contempt and set our eyes on far off goals. Keep us at tasks too hard for us that we may be driven to thee for strength. Open our eyes to simple beauty all around us and our hearts to the loveliness men hide from us because we do not try to understand them. Save us from ourselves and show us a vision of a world made new. Thank you. All right, we have about 15 minutes and I'd uh, welcome uh, questions or comments, uh, other ideas for ways in which human rights norms are implemented, ways you've been involved in implementing them. Uh, and I see a hand uh, up here to begin. Don.
Thank you very much for your uh, stirring presentation. Uh, first, a little comment and then a question. Uh, we spent, as you know, two years in, in uh, Europe, in Geneva, uh, promoting and protecting uh, human rights, uh, freedom of religion in particular, uh, as government relations missionaries. Uh, we always made a point in that context not to say freedom of conscience uh, and belief, uh, simply because there were so many people who found it very easy to dismiss organized religion in that context. And so uh, we always referred to this simply as freedom of religion. And some people didn't agree, but gave us a, that, that gave us an opportunity to say uh, what, we, what, we were, what we felt. That is the tendency in, in Europe and in the uh, Human Rights Council to uh, reduce Article 18 and all of its derivative uh, manifestations to uh, something that's inside your, 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 yourself, but you cannot really uh, talk about it, proselyte it, uh, use it. Sorry, just an observation. Um, my worry is about Europe. Uh, in a continent where uh, the U.S. Constitution, of course, has no 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 standing and in, in, in isn't spoken of. People don't define freedom of religion uh, in terms of Article of the First Amendment. It's uh, Article 18 and so on. Uh, if that's the way we define freedom of religion, in and, and no other, basically. Is uh, same-sex marriage a threat to that definition of freedom of religion? We don't see the church uh, talking about this in, in Europe. Uh, what, what's going on? Why, why is there this, uh, this difference? Is it a U.S. matter only, or uh, what's, your, what's your view on that? Well, uh, let me uh, respond first to your comment and then to your question. Uh, with respect to your comment, I think that uh, what, what I have found working internationally is that it's helpful to use the ideas of uh, thought, conscience, belief, and religion together uh, because it's a way of being inclusive to non-religious as well as religious viewpoints. Religious people are often viewed as being engaged in a sort of self uh, uh, special pleading, that we care about rights for ourselves, uh, but not for other people. And that couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, if uh, thinking back to the theology that I was describing, uh, the rights of freedom of conscience, the rights of uh, moral agency, are really at the heart of uh, LDS understanding of the plan of uh, salvation. And so it's not just important for us to have our religious freedom. It's important for all people everywhere to have moral agency. Um, and I think you want to be sensitive to the situation you're in and the audience that you're with and uh, realize that the terms and the terminology we use can make a big difference. I think that if you start talking about the First Amendment in Europe, you're not likely to get very far. For one thing, they don't have anything like the prohibition on establishment that we have in the First Amendment. And so it's easy for Europeans to say, well, your experience is completely different. It's idiosyncratic. It has nothing to do with Europe. Um, I don't think it's quite as simple as that because the problems of establishment come up. They come up sometimes in the guise of non-discrimination and so forth. So. Uh, I find that using the international human rights terminology is a way of building bridges, but the truth is human rights terminology is sometimes viewed in some places as Western imperial imposition of the powerful on the powerless. I had this point made in Indonesia recently, and I said, well, are you concerned about the treatment of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar? I said, yes, of course, it's outrageous. I said, well, then you believe in international human rights, and you are the big bully. Indonesia is pushing around Myanmar and saying, you are mistreating a religious minority. Uh, I think it's great for Muslims in Indonesia to be standing up for uh, Muslims in uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, where they're a mi tiny minority. The Buddhists are uh, the big uh, majority in Myanmar. But how much better if they were standing up for religious minorities in uh, Indonesia uh, as well? Now, your second question about uh, same-sex marriage. 
I think there are two ways this can be conceptualized. One is as a marriage problem and the other as a, uh, not as a discrimination problem. Uh, if same-sex marriage is viewed as a marriage problem, I don't think there's much of a risk for religious groups because religious groups have always been allowed to use religious criteria for determining who is and is not eligible to be married in their churches or synagogues or mosques. So for example, you know, when the Catholic Church says you have to agree to raise your children within the Catholic Church in order to be married in the Catholic Church, they're allowed to do that and we don't bully or berate them for doing that. And the same for the Jews in their synagogue and Mormons in their temple. I think that we understand that religious criteria for religious marriages make sense. If, on the other hand, this is viewed primarily as a discrimination problem, here I'm thinking of uh, 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 the Loving case. Uh, if this is viewed as akin to racial discrimination, that if you don't marry same-sex couples in your church, you are doing something which is just as bad as refusing to marry uh, interracial uh, couples in your church, then I think we're in a, in, 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 a, in a world of trouble. And I think the reality is there are really important differences between discrimination on the basis of race and uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. But the big push is to collapse those into the the same sort of category. And so I think that type of um, collapse uh, 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 needs to be resisted because if this is viewed primarily as a Loving versus Virginia problem, then I think the risks are uh, significant. The European solution, of course, has been to disconnect religious marriage from civil marriage. And so you don't get married in the temple in Europe until you've already been civilly married and the, uh, the temple marriage doesn't have any civil effect. And so in a way, that type of situation is protective of religious freedom because the religious marriage isn't tied up as closely with the rights of uh, uh, civil marriage. And, you know, there are, as Robin Fretwell Wilson was describing yesterday, there are, you know, large calls for religious groups to withdraw from civil marriage uh, as a way of avoiding the implications of, of uh, uh, same-sex marriage. Her concern was that by withdrawing in that way, some of the moral capital uh, of marriage is lost. And uh, if you look at the status of marriage in Europe, it, you could say that maybe that uh, argument has uh, some uh, validity. Uh, because uh, 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 marriage is not a particularly strong institution uh, in, in, in Europe. So uh, I think we're in uncharted waters. We're not quite sure what lies ahead. I'm just wondering if you could uh, comment on the Canadian experience with the introduction of the Charter of Rights. Um, and because there's a, I mean, a lot of talk among some groups that, um, you know, that there wasn't really necessarily a lack of human rights in Canada before the implementation of this charter, but that it's actually given the court a lot of power um, and taken it away from the legislature in deciding on issues. Yeah. Um, and it seems to be uh, happening more and more. And so, you know, what is, what is the place for an introduction of a charter in, in kind of a, a country to, um, like, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but do you have any comments on yeah, that? Yeah, so it's a great question. So um, the Canadian Charter of Rights has very strong protections of religious freedom, but the prevailing norm in rights jurisprudence is non-discrimination. It was real, one of the things that was really brilliant about Governor Herbert's presentation, I don't know if you noticed this, but he was contrasting discrimination against gays and lesbians against discrimination against uh, 
religious groups and individuals. I think that's the right way, or one right way to characterize this. Because if it's a freedom claim versus a non-discrimination claim, boy, our, our reaction is to really side with non-discrimination. And actually, religious groups learned this in Establishment Clause jurisprudence. Because when they were arguing for religious freedom, they were losing all the time. So when they argued for non-discrimination in access to funds, participation in programs that they started to win. They took that liberal non-discrimination argument and, and, and used it. It was actually one guy, Jay Sekulow, who figured this out and won about half dozen important Supreme Court cases making non-discrimination arguments. So I think the challenge of uh, the example of the Canadian Charter of Rights is the non-discrimination norms are so much more resonant these days than the freedom norms that uh, the sexual minority rights, for example, are characterized as non-discrimination norms, and so they tend to win. I was involved about five to seven years ago in a series of conferences in Australia about a proposed Bill of Rights in Australia. And the strongest opposition to that Bill of Rights, which has still not been act enacted, there's no Bill of Rights, uh, no Charter of Rights in Australia, came from whom? Religious groups. The reason it came from religious groups is because of this very fear. They were afraid that in the environment of judicial-ism, that the non-discrimination norms would trump the freedom of religion norms. And they felt like we're better off in the political milieu than we are in the judicial milieu. And I was an outsider, but we have a Bill of Rights and we have judicial protection and enforcement of rights. And so my instinct was to think a Bill of Rights is a good thing. Um, but there are disadvantages in living in a judgeocracy. And, uh, you know, this week we kind of feel like we're living in one. And so uh, uh, I, I think you raise a really important and uh, challenging issue. Uh, one, I, I think I'm at the deadline, but if, if you'll ask a short question, I'll try to give a short answer. It's going to be a bigger challenge for me than it will be for you. Uh, okay. This is uh, maybe not the best time for this question, but I'll ask it and you can see how much you want to answer. So um, Governor Herbert said something while he was talking about the baking case in Oregon. And it was really interesting to me because I see that case as extremely problematic. Uh, and it rem as I thought of it, it reminded me of something that Professor Goldfeder said yesterday about the ACLJ which you just mentioned, is, which is that they've had a lot of success in some cases characterizing the rights as free speech rights uh, and, and not just as freedom of religion rights. And I thought about that and I thought uh, the governor said that the, um, the, the homosexuals who wanted to get married and they wanted the baker to, to help them with the ceremony, they complained about, about feeling uh, embarrassed and ashamed uh, and, and uncomfortable because of what the baking company had, di uh, had done. And to some extent at least, not in all contexts and not with all people and not in all places, but I, part of my response to that argument is that, well, you should feel embarrassed and you should feel ashamed and you should feel uncomfortable because what you're doing is really wrong. It's really immoral and you should stop and you should do something else. And I feel like I should have the right, when I believe uh, it's appropriate, to say that in very clear and, and forceful terms. And I see that as a, a religious right and as uh, a, a free speech right, as a, as a right of freedom of expression. And I thought about it again as you were going over some of the international covenants. And I wondered uh, if you have seen or heard of anyone using the international covenants to support an argument like that, that, that opposition to same-sex marriage is, is a freedom of religion thing, it's a freedom of speech thing, it's a freedom of expression thing, or, or maybe it's, uh, I don't know, there's something in the international covenants that we talked about. So I was wondering if you've seen that, uh, to what extent you've seen that, and also 
if you can imagine other ways of using those international covenants to support an argument like that that maybe you haven't actually seen people use. So maybe not the best question for a short answer, but that was my question. Okay, so it's a great question. The issue of uh, small businesses uh, discriminating is an old one. Uh, the way handled in the civil rights law was to basically carve out very small businesses. So we basically said we're going to address discrimination by tackling businesses with fewer than 50, now it's 15 uh, employees. And I think there's, th that makes some sense. I think sometimes we might want to just treat really small uh, businesses a little bit differently. We do it with respect to the civil rights laws. Um, second is, these types of issues have come up in a lot of places. I saw a case from Northern Ireland where there was a baker that they wanted a cake that was Bert and Ernie, and it was saying, you know, uh, marriage is for everyone, and uh, it was a very small business, and, and they said, no, uh, you know, I don't like Sesame Street characters being used in that way to promote a gay rights agenda, and I'm, I'm opposed to gay marriage. And they, they, they were fined and, and, and subject to the, uh, the same sort of uh, experience that the photographers and cake makers and um, uh, uh, florists have experienced in some places in the United States. It makes me uneasy. I mean, I think, for example, there was another case recently of a bake bakery that was run by a couple of gay people and someone came in and wanted the cake that said marriage is only f for men and women. And they said no. And there was no lawsuit against them brought by the so the, the, the commissioner for equality uh, of the state. It was, well, you know, they disagreed with that. It was sort of provocative that they were asked to do it. They were, the people asking for it were trying to pick a fight and we're going to ignore it. And frankly, I think that's what's happening in most of these uh, service cases. I mean, I think a lot of times it's just people trying to uh, bully others. Now, I think Robin Fretwell Wilson's point about denial of services and the embarrassment that takes place is an important one. And we don't want people walking into McDonald's and not getting served. Uh, I don't think anyone is proposing uh, that that happens. But imagine someone who is a lawyer and a client comes in and says, you know, I represent, uh, you know, m my business is, uh, you know, uh, you know, someone gave me this example yesterday. My business is representing uh, uh, people who, uh, a, a, an app which is designed to help homosexual men hook up uh, when they're traveling. And, and should you have a right to say, hmm, that, that's, not a, the, that's just not in my wheelhouse. That's not a cause I want. Not that you're not entitled to have legal representation, but I don't have to represent you. I think most of us would say that a lawyer has a right to decline a client uh, based upon that client's cause. I mean, think of all the law firms around the country that have chosen not to represent uh, traditional marriage. Uh, and I think they have a right to do that. Uh, but they're discriminating on the basis of religion when they do that. Uh, but we let them do that, and that's part of uh, the, the, the culture of, uh, of, of how legal services works. Or imagine you're a freelance writer and you write press releases for companies. And a company comes and says, or a political party comes and says, I want you to write press releases uh, for, you know, Bobby Jindal. And you say, actually, I support Hillary Clinton. I'm not going to write press releases for Bobby Jindal. Are we going to say that they're engaged in a violation of the free speech of Bobby Jindal? I think we're going to say no. We're going to say uh, you can choose. Uh, uh, as a freelance writer, which causes you're going to uh, support. And if, if it's Energy Solutions that comes out and says, I want you to write a press release to make sure that I'm not regulated on my, you know, my nuclear uh, disposal facility, you say, well, actually, I'm on the other side. I, I think that you ought not be dumping radioactive waste in the desert of Utah. I don't think we're going to say their free speech rights uh, have, have, have been violated. And so I tend to see these expressive cases involving the very close connection to marriage a little bit more like that freelance writer and a little bit less like McDonald's. And you can make an argument that it's more like one than the other. I mean, we're in search of the better analogy. I think the better analogy for the baker and the photographer and uh, the florist is the freelance writer.
I think what they're being asked to do is much more expressive and much more an endorsement of a particular viewpoint that we ought not force on people. Now, you know, if you're going to Safeway and ordering a cake, I'd come out differently. I mean, I think Safeway can have some regulations. I mean, are we going to allow Safeway to not print the Confederate flag uh, on their cake? I think we're going to say yes to that, even though that violates uh, 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 someone's uh, freedom of speech. So even that is not uh, a case in which we're going to necessarily uh, be even-handed in, 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 our, in our reactions. I was in South Africa, and uh, Albie Sachs, who is one of the constitutional court justices in South Africa, who lost an arm and an eye to an explosion uh, against, that was targeting him when he was uh, a, a social activist against apartheid. He's a white man. Uh, he was talking about this issue of, you know, do you coerce the small business owner to not discriminate? And he said, you know, in South Africa, we faced this problem, and we didn't force them. And he said, I think that was the right decision, because this is a matter where we want to change hearts <coughs> rather than coerce hearts. And I think the likelihood of getting good outcomes that are going to be socially harmonious are going to be if we give each other some social space to live our convictions, even when they're a little bit unpopular, even when they might result in something that is or looks like discrimination. You know, if someone's a photographer and I go in and I say, I'd like you to photograph my marriage, and they say, but you're Mormon, uh, I just don't feel comfortable, you know. I, you know, I'm down at Temple Square and it makes me feel uneasy because, you know, I'm whatever and, uh, you know, I just, get agitated when I think of the church's position on X, you know, it's, you'd be better off with someone else. You know what? That's discrimination on the basis of religion. And I think that's okay. I think it's okay for that photographer to tell me, you know what, it's just not a, uh, you, you, you'd be better off with someone else. And so I think we do have to be willing to take it both ways. I have to be willing to accept some discrimination against me on the basis of religion if I am going to accept the right of the baker and the florist and the photographer to turn down business. But I think that right ought to extend to them to you know, turn down business to a heterosexual couple as well. Uh, if that heterosexual couple wants to make a really aggressive statement that marriage is only for uh, men and women and they want to put it on the cakes and the flags and the flowers and so forth and if you disagree with that I don't think you should be coerced into uh, being a part of that wedding so I guess I cite a little bit more for freedom and a little bit less for the principle of non-discrimination but I hope we can uh, extend that uh, that latitude uh, in, in, in multiple directions all right, sorry, I was not able to give a short answer. As you proceed to lunch, you'll be handed copies of survey. We're asking you to fill this out so that we can learn from you what, how we can improve this conference for future years. Uh, if you can have some time during lunch to fill that out, and if you'll be asked to return it after lunch, if you don't mind. Thank you so much.